degrees. Yeah, you just subtract one from that. So degrees of freedom is the sample size minus one or 22. Now we're going to find t up over 2. That's our critical value. When I say critical value, that's, that's what that means. We're going to go ahead and we're going to find that. I need you to take out your tables. You know that pull-out sheet that you all have? Looks like this. Or it's in the back of your book. It's table A3. So find your A3 for me. See that? We hope if I have lights. Whoa! They just burn your retinas? They burn my retinas. That was crazy. Retinas are in your eyeballs, right, anatomy? That's what I thought. Okay. So we have this T distribution. Oh, it is a lowercase letter T. See, I, I told you, I just can't write lowercase. Anyway, so we have a T distribution. It says critical T values. That's exactly what we're looking for. Let's look at this chart. Just kind of, kind of look at it for a second. What's on the left-hand side? Hey, do you know how to find that now? Yes. So you're not looking up sample size. You're actually looking up degrees of freedom. T distributions are often, very often used for small sample sizes. So I'll talk about why in just a bit. Okay, but most of the time your samples are under 30. You just have to know they're coming from a normal, normally distributed population. Are you with me on that? So most of the time they're under 30. No problem. Now, if you look up at the top, it says something weird. It says area in one tail, areas in two tails. I need you to understand that on our graph, we have a normally distributed curve, right? We have this bell-shaped curve, and we have how many tails? Two. two tails. If we're dealing with a 95, I had you write this down for a reason. If we're dealing with a 95% confidence level, the alpha is 5%. Right? 0 0.05. That's the area that's combined in both tails. Are you with me on this? If the area in both tails is 0 0.05, how much is in one tail? 0 0.025. Do you figure out how we get 0 0.025? Look what this says. If you're talking about the area in two tails, these things mean the same thing. It's just divided for you. Look at that. Area in two tails, our tails combined, is 0 0.05. you with me? Or if you want to think about it as one tail, how much area is in one tail? 0 0.025. These columns mean the same thing. Area in one tail would be 0 0.025, or the area in both tails combined would be 0 0.05. Either way, we're in this column. Raise your hand if you understand that. Good. Okay, so for our confidence intervals, you can think about alpha as being in both tails. So this right here is your alpha. This is your alpha, and this is your alpha over 2. On your table, if you want, you can go ahead and write... Alpha, alpha over 2. Go ahead and write that right there if you'd like to. That's for your like, right, confidence intervals above that little column. So right here I'd be putting, on your paper, I'd be putting uh, confidence interval, CI right here, and I'd put alpha, <coughs> alpha over 2. Or did I have that back? No, I had that back, I'm sorry. Uh, put alpha <coughs> here. My fingers are too fat. Put alpha 
here. <laughs> put alpha over 2 here. Put ci here. That's for confidence intervals only. Okie dokie. Y'all with me, folks. Uh, sorry about who it's ever this was. Anyhow. So let's go ahead. Let's do our T critical value. Can y'all tell me what was our degrees of freedom that we should be looking at here? 22. 22. Okay. So we're going to go down to 22. That's right here. We're going to go over to our either our alpha, which is this column, or our alpha over 2, which is this column. It's the same thing. We're going to go all the way down to the meetup. 22, that should be 2.074. Do you all find 2.074? You should have your table as well, be doing the same exact thing, 2.074. You with me? Now, stop. Think back to Z scores, okay? Think back to Z scores. If I said, ignore this table, don't look at this table. If I said to you, hey, find me the critical value for a 95% confidence level, you would be telling me one point. 96. You'd be telling me 1.96. You're with me for a 95% confidence level. What's a T distribution do? Is that bigger or smaller? Bigger. That means for the same level of confidence, you're going to have a wider spread, which means that your T distributions aren't as accurate. Why not? Because you do not know the population standard deviation. Does that make sense? You estimate it with a sample. That's why. That's why it's going to be a little bit wider. Now, I need you to look what happens. Okay, check this out. Look what happens for a very, very small sample. This would be a sample of two. You're not going to have a sample of one. Okay, that would that, that'd be irrelevant. You'd have all the information right there. But if you have a sample of two, look at that. That's your critical value. That's way bigger than 1.96, right? That's going to be a huge, huge spread. My, I'm going to fill up the whole screen with how, how wide that spread's going to be. That's crazy. But look what happens. As soon as you start getting bigger and bigger samples, what's happening to this critical value? Okay, now I have a critical thinking type question for you. We're thinking with critical value, so critical thinking fits right into this. As my sample size goes up, what do you think this number is going to approach? What do you think? Zero. No, not zero. Zero would mean you'd have no spread whatsoever. <coughs> not one. Two. Not two. Let me ask you another question. What's the critical value for a z-score when you know the population standard deviation? For a 95% confidence level? 1.96. 1.96 is for a z-score when you know the population standard deviation. You with me? Now, if you take samples big enough, it's going to be so large that that sample standard deviation is going to be pretty close to the population standard deviation, right? Pretty darn close. As you go higher and higher in sample size, look what happens. Look at the very bottom of your table. What's it say for, oh wow, it's a long way down there. Look at this. We're still in this column, right? This, is a, this was a 95% confidence level. Are you with me on that? This column right here. So we go, oh, two, two, two. Oh, we're in the ones. So it obviously it doesn't max out at two, right? That's just for a sample size of 61. We go down here, oh my, what's it getting close to? <coughs> Holy cow, why does it say N large? That means as you're getting really big, big samples. Why does that happen? Because as you take large samples, the sample standard deviation is really closely approximating the population standard deviation. Therefore, a T-score will automatically become a Z-score, value-wise, as we get big enough. Does that make sense? You sure you followed that? So are T-scores the same as Z-scores? No, clearly not. They change for every sample that you take. That's what's weird about them, right? You take a sample of 35, it's different than 36. It's different than 40. It's different than 25. That didn't happen with Z-scores. So for every different size of sample, you're going to have a different critical value. Are you going to really need to know how to read this chart? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely, you're going to need to know how to do that. Because for every different sample, you've got a different value. But as you get big enough, as your sample approaches... Well, this says above 2,000, but as it's approaching infinity, really, is when we have our C score exactly matching our T score. And that's how this thing works. For big enough, it, it works just fine. Look at this one. How about for, uh, that one look familiar? That's for 90. That's our 90 column. That one look familiar? It's pretty close. 2.57, this is 7.6, but we should have 2.575 for Z scores, right? So it's really, really close. 
Okay. Would you please raise your hand if you understand how to find a T, T critical value? Good, that's the only new thing I gotta teach you. You know why? Because after we do a T critical value, everything else is almost exactly the same as what we did. This was 2.074 if I remember right. But after you find that, after you do your T critical value, which is the hardest part, you're gonna do the same exact thing with your E, the same exact thing with your confidence intervals, it'll be exactly like your homework that you just turned in. Was it 2.074? Yeah. Okay, so we'll talk about our, our E, that's our margin of error. The E is going to look awfully similar to the E for our, our last section when we were estimating the population mean knowing the standard deviation for the population. We're still going to have a critical value, we're still going to have a standard deviation, and we're still going to have a sample size. But the only thing that, cha that doesn't change uh, using the letter is the sample size. N is N no matter what you're talking about. So when we're doing this, sure, we're going to have a critical value here, and we're going to be multiplying by something over the square root of N. Hey, tell me, thinking back to the last section, what normally would go here? For a... Good. And what symbol did we use to represent that? For a population, it was sigma. Are you going to know sigma in this section? No. no. So we have to use a different standard deviation. The whole reason why we even need a t-score, because we're using not the population standard deviation, but the... And what letter represents that? S. Great. So the only difference here is that we're using S. Now, the critical value, can I use a T critical value or a Z critical value? Which one? T. T. Why? I don't know sigma. That's why we have S there, right? If we knew sigma, we'd have a Z. Z and sigma go together. T and S go together. Oops. That's not a T. Does the E look familiar to you? It's just a number, critical value, S, standard deviation over the square root of our sample size, N. That's all it is. And if that's the case, then our confidence intervals are exactly the same as last time. We're just going to take our X bar minus E and X bar plus E and surround our population mean with that. Because E is still the maximum difference between our point estimate, remember our point estimate, and our population parameter. It's still the maximum difference. So if I subtract it from the point estimate and add it to the point estimate, it's giving me that range of numbers to which I'm a certain level of confidence that, it's gonna, that the actual population parameter is going to fall in that range. I've said that like 50 times now. But that's always the same interpretation. You okay so far? Now, I, I normally list out the steps, but honestly, the steps are exactly the same as the last one. Number one, you're going to check to see if your requirements are met. Same as last section. You check that, right? For this, you, you need an N. Well, obviously, <coughs> random sample, or sample. The N has to be bigger than 30. Or if it's not, it has to come from a normally distributed population. Second thing, or third thing, I guess, if you consider that random sample is, 